Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this riveting video today, we are going to be discussing megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemias. Okay, let's get started. If you've not already checked out my lectures on erythrocytes and red cell morphology, you will want to check out those videos before you continue with this one. So this lecture is about uh, megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic anemias. And these are types of what we call macrocytic anemias. So what do you think macrocytic anemia means? Can you take a guess? So what, what is a macrocyte? So it's a, a red blood cell that is abnormally large, right? So if we describe a red blood cell being normocytic, they're normal sized. And if we describe a red blood cell that is microcytic, they're smaller than normal. So macrocytes are larger. And do we remember what red blood cell indice describes the size of the red blood cell? If you said mean cell volume or MCV, you're correct. So the normal MCV of a patient should be 80 to 100 femtoliters. If the patient's MC value is greater than 100, 100 femtoliters, uh, they will have macrocytes in their peripheral bloodstream. So megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic anemias are anemias that are classified because the patients have mac macrocytes that are present in their peripheral bloodstream. Uh, patients will also have typical anemia symptoms, fatigue, weakness, paleness, in conjunction with those macrocytes. So both of these have macrocytic red blood cells like we just discussed, but what is the difference between megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic? So megaloblastic anemias are due to an abnormal defective uh, synthesis of DNA, most often due to either deficiencies or abnormal metabolism of vitamin B12 and folate. Non-megaloblastic anemias are macrocytic anemias that are caused by a couple of different things like alcoholism and liver disease. Now, before we get into these anemias, I want to talk about folate and vitamin B12 because they are very important for megaloblastic anemia development. So folate or folic acid is a vitamin that is important in the formation of DNA and the red blood cell. This vitamin is found mostly in dark leafy green vegetables, beans, beef liver, and some fruits like oranges and strawberries. The recommended daily amount of folate is around 200 micrograms a day, with 50 micro micrograms a day being the minimum daily requirement. 50 to 80 percent of this will be absorbed by the intestine. Our liver store around 5 to 10 milligrams of folate. So this storage is important if we do not eat enough folate in our diet. It can provide us the necessary daily requirement of folate for around three to six months. Folate is considered a prenatal vitamin, meaning it's a very important in pregnancy, which we'll talk about on the next slide here. So folate is absolutely essential in pregnancy as a lack of it can cause severe birth defects like something we call spina bifida. So spina bifida is where the spine and spinal cord do not properly form in utero. So it ranges from mild to severe and can result in a sac of the spinal fluid and spinal nerves being exposed, as you can see in this picture on the right hand side of the slide. So it's important to note that spina bifida is not a megaloblastic or non-megaloblastic anemia. It's a neural tube defect caused by a folate deficiency in pregnancy. So we were just discussing folate here and I just wanted to put it in here because it's so important. I talk quite a bit about folate in my vitamin video in my clinical chemistry lecture series. So how does somebody develop a folate deficiency? So not eating enough folate in their diet. So uh, folate is absorbed in the small intestine. So if the patient is not eating enough foods rich in folate or not taking folate supplements if needed, of course, uh, there will not be enough present within the body. This can occur in elderly patients or those that are poor and cannot afford to purchase appropriate foods. This can also occur in people that have an increased need for folate, like those that are pregnant, which we just talked about. Also in patients that have hemolytic anemia or those with cancers. Uh, patients with intestinal diseases can de become deficient in folate. It's absorbed from food in the small intestine. If there's an issue in the intestine that causes malabsorption of the folate, that's obviously gonna lead to a deficiency in this vitamin. Also, there are certain drugs that can be uh, taken that inhibit folate. Now, I'm not talking about like street drugs here. I mean like prescription medications like oral contraceptives or long-term anticoagulant drugs. Now, vitamin B12 is also called cobalamin. 
uh, this vitamin is present in animal products like liver, milk, and eggs. It's essential for the formation of red blood cells, DNA, and also for proper neurological functioning. We need to consume around five to seven micrograms of vitamin B12 a day to, um, uh, to uh, have proper functioning. So the liver, heart, and kidneys store around 5,000 micrograms of this vitamin, with it primarily uh, being stored in the liver. Because there's so much of this vitamin being stored and only a small amount being used by the body daily, it actually takes several years of not eating vitamin B12 in order for a deficiency to develop. Vitamin B12 is not in vegetable sources, so vegans have a high risk of developing this deficiency. In case you don't know what that term is, vegans are those that abstain from eating or using animal products. So it's important to understand how vitamin B12 is absorbed into the body. So we eat the source of vitamin B12. So again, liver, milk, eggs, those types of things. There's a protein called haptocorin that's present within the saliva. It binds to, to vitamin B12 and forms a complex. And the purpose of this complex is that once it's complex, it's protected, that vitamin B12 is protected from the acid of the stomach. So it goes into the stomach, then into the small intestine. And once it gets into the small intestine, the vitamin B12 is released from this complex. It's then bound by something we call intrinsic factor. I and mean, this intrinsic factor is produced by the gastric parietal cells that are in the digestive system. Vitamin B12 must be bound to this intrinsic factor in order for it to be absorbed by the ileal cells in the small intestine. So once it's absorbed in those small intestines, it's sent to the plasma to be picked up for transportation to be used by the body. If a patient doesn't eat enough vitamin B12, obviously that can cause a deficiency, but also impaired absorption of vitamin B12 um, also causes a deficiency, even if an adequate amount is being consumed by the patient. Uh, there can just be general malabsorption. Um, also, the patient may lack intrinsic factor. Uh, remember, intrinsic factor must be present and bind to the vitamin B12 in order for it to be absorbed by the small intestine. So if there is no intrinsic factor, the vitamin B12 will not be able to be absorbed. Also, if the vitamin B12 isn't separated from that vitamin B12 haptocorin complex, uh, the vitamin B12 will not be able to bind with the intrinsic factor, even if it's present. So all of these cause impaired absorption of vitamin B12 and will lead to a deficiency. Now recall that vitamin B12 is important for proper neurological functioning. Patients that are deficient in this vitamin can experience neurological disturbances, uh, which may or may not be permanent. So this can cause things like memory loss, numbness, tingling, loss of balance, and even a psychosis. So how do these vitamin deficiencies cause megaloblastic anemia? So both folate and vitamin B12 function in the production of DNA and red blood cells. The body does a really good job of regulating itself. So if there are nuclear maturation defects in the red blood cells caused by these deficiencies, uh, the body's gonna get rid of these red blood cells or red blood cell precursors. So they aren't gonna work properly, so they're destroyed. And if there's a ton of ineffective erythropoiesis happening in the bone marrow, normal red blood cells are not going to be produced or produced in lower quantities. Um, and this is what leads to the anemia. Now, megaloblastic anemia causes ineffective erythropoiesis. So this is ineffective red blood cell production. So other nucleated cells aren't ineffectively produced with this type of anemia. However, neutrophils have an interesting characteristic in patients that have megaloblastic anemia. So this, uh, this white cell on the screen is a segmented neutrophil that hopefully you can tell looks a little weird. So look at how many lobes of the nucleus it has. So here's a lobe, and here's a lobe, and here's a lobe, lobe, lobe. There's tons of lobes here. That's not normal, right? Um, so this is a what we call a hypersegmented neutrophil, and these hypersegmented neutrophils are characterized by having more than five lobes of their nucleus. Uh, so these are in the peripheral blood of someone who has megaloblastic anemia, in addition to those macrocytic red blood cells. Patients that have megaloblastic anemia are going to have a pretty straightforward anemic patient uh, symptoms. Uh, they're going to be fatigued, lethargic, weak, 
They can be pale or have a yellow or waxy pallor to their skin. Um, now, they, uh, these patients may have indigestion with nausea, diarrhea, or, or even constipation. Um, glossitis, which is an inflammation of the tongue, may also be present along with uh, unexpected weight loss. Patients that have megaloblastic anemia are going to have a decrease H and H, which is what? So hemoglobin and hematocrit is H and H, and they also have a decreased platelet count or can have a decreased platelet count. Uh, they are going to have uh, an increased MCV, which we've already discussed, and they're going to have an increased red cell distribution with their RDW. In the peripheral blood smear, we are going to see oval macrocytes, which makes sense, right, because of that MCV value being increased. Uh, we can also see how jolly bodies, basophilic stippling, cabot rings, decryocytes, and even schistocytes. So again, if you haven't checked out my red cell morphology lecture video, please go watch that. I talk about all those different morphologies in detail on there. Uh, so those are things we're going to be seeing on the hematology testing aspect on the complete blood counter CBC. We can also see abnormal clinical chemistry results. So uh, the patient's bilirubin and lactate dehydrogenase, or LD, can be elevated. Um, and this is because those red blood cells are not being made properly and they're getting destroyed because they're abnormal. So LD is present in red cells uh, and bilirubin is produced from the breakdown of the hemoglobin molecule that's present in the red blood cell. So we have an increase of both bilirubin and lactate dehydrogenase in the patient's serum. So the physician is going to be looking um, at these, these patient's symptoms, run a complete blood count and complete metabolic panel. They're likely going to have a suspicion of what is going on. So how do they confirm this diagnosis? So they can run a folate and a vitamin B12 level on uh, the patient's blood. So these are tests that are run in the clinical chemistry department of the laboratory. There are also antibody assays towards intrinsic factor and parietal cells. Uh, so those would check to see if the patient has an issue with either their parietal cells, which are uh, producing intrinsic factor, or an issue with the intrinsic factor itself. Um, also, a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy can uh, be performed to confirm uh, this diagnosis. So once the deficiency is determined, it needs to be treated appropriately. So if it's a deficiency of folate, folate supplements will be given. If it's a deficiency of vitamin B12, vitamin B12 supplements can be given. Now, the bone marrow responds pretty quickly to these treatments, which is great. Um, the granulocyte abnormalities, meaning the, the hypersegmented neutrophils, um, disappear a little bit more slowly. So usually two weeks or so after the supplements are given, the hypersegmented neutrophils start to disappear uh, from the peripheral bloodstream. So I mentioned about the treatments for megaloblastic anemia if it's caused by not consuming enough folate or vitamin B12. You just take supplements for it. But you're probably wondering, Rebecca, what, what about if the patient has no intrinsic factor? Uh, what do you do then? Well, you're probably just wondering when this lecture will be over. <laughs> uh, I feel you, I feel you. We're almost done. We're almost done. We just got a couple more slides left. Um, so pernicious anemia is a type of megaloblastic anemia that is due to the absence of intrinsic factor. And as I've said before, intrinsic factor needs to be present in order for it to bind to vitamin B12 and allow that vitamin to be absorbed into the small intestine. So this is either caused by the loss of intrinsic factor secreting gastric cells or antibodies that block the actions of intrinsic factor. So this usually occurs in patients that are 50 years of age and older. There used to be a test called the Schilling test that would test for this. Uh, the patient was giving, uh, given a radio labeled vitamin B12 and this showed whether or not the, the B12 was absorbed from the intestinal tract properly. It's no longer done. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, an outdated test now. Uh, physicians now look for the presence of antibodies to intrinsic factor to help diagnose patients with this. So patients with pernicious anemia are treated with lifelong uh, hydroxycobalamin injections. So this is a natural form of vitamin B12 that's produced by bacteria. If patients experience spinal cord, cord damage uh, because of their pernicious anemia, unfortunately this is permanent. Those injections are not going to, to solve anything for that. But any type of peripheral neuropathy that uh, they are experiencing is reversed with these injections. 
So those are the megaloblastic anemias. So now, now let's talk about non-megaloblastic anemias. So like megaloblastic anemias, uh, non-megaloblastic anemias are characterized by, of course, those macrocytic red blood cells. So MCVs that are greater than 100 femtoliters. There are some morphological differences that occur in non-megaloblastic anemia. So the macrocytes are generally more round in shape uh, due to increased membrane lipids. Uh, there are no white blood cell or platelet abnormalities in non-megaloblastic anemias. And there may be an increase of reticulocytes present uh, within the peripheral blood. Non-megaloblastic anemia caused by alcoholism usually causes mild macrocytosis in the red blood cells, so MCVs around 100 to 110 femtoliters. Uh, the ethanol in alcoholic drinks can contribute a toxic effect to developing red blood cells, so there may be vacuoles present in the precursors to red blood cells that are in the uh, bone marrow. Non-megaloblastic anemia caused by liver disease is usually caused by alcohol abuse, so they're, they're definitely related. Um, so it can also be caused by hepatitis, which is an inflammation of the liver. Obstructive jaundice can cause this as well. So this is where there's a blockage of the flow of bile out of the liver caused by anything from uh, inflammation, tumors, cancers, trauma, etc. Hemolysis is present uh, in these patients, meaning that the red cells are uh, lysing prematurely. And liver function testing can help with the diagnosing um, of these patients. So hepatic panel, so ALT, AST, ALP, and bilirubin. Alrighty, so that ends my lecture on megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic anemias. Hopefully this helped you. If it did, go ahead and give this video a like and uh, make sure to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. And as always, if you have any questions about this lecture, please feel, to leave, feel free to leave them down in the comment. Or if you have any suggestions on topics um, in the medical laboratory that you would like me to cover, please leave those in the comments as well. Alrighty, until next time.